Are you an overwhelmed SaaS founder ready to make the leap from leading a team to leading an organization? Join us each week as we refill your think tank with actionable tips and strategies from great business minds you know and those you don't know yet. This is SaaS Fuel with your host, five-time entrepreneur, SaaS founder, and globetrotting adventurer, Jeff Maines. Well, aloha and welcome back to the SaaS Fuel Podcast, where building a great SaaS company is less cooking up an idea and more mastering a five-star recipe while well, yeah. juggling flaming spatulas. I'm your host, Jeff Maines. I help B2B SaaS founders like you build amazing businesses that get premium valuations while not missing out on the most important moments in life and most important relationships. We are still on the big island here in Hawaii, which is actually called Hawaii. I don't know why they don't formally rename it the Big Island, but uh, it's the newest one too. Uh, interesting factoid, the other day I was on the top of the tallest mountain on Earth. And uh, no, it's not Mount Everest. There's a mountain here called Mauna Kea, 33,484 feet tall, over 4,000 feet taller than Mount Everest. 13,796 feet is above the water and the other 18,000 some odd feet underwater. Uh, the water's pretty deep around here. You know, I thought the Bahamas was deep. I'm kind of peering over the edge of a 3,000 foot drop off. And here the average depth is about 15,000 feet. So you don't want to drop your phone or your GoPro because it's not coming back. In the span of about 90 minutes, we went from sea level up to almost 14,000 feet. I mean, wow, I mean, that, that is a massive, massive change. Beautiful stars. Uh, I saw satellites passing over, shooting stars. It's absolutely gorgeous. I'll drop some pics on social for you. Now, I didn't know this, but there are actually 12 telescopes on top of the mountain. It's an amazing, amazing place. And uh, I love playing around on the bottom of the ocean, you know, 100 feet, not 15,000 feet. And this was a really close second, or, you know, might even top it. Just don't tell the sharks I said that, okay? Yeah, it might make them grumpy. Well, the food here is pretty amazing too. There's a real mix of cultures. You have native Hawaiian, Polynesian, Filipino, Japanese, American. The history here is, is very rich, a lot of diversity, pretty fascinating actually, and, and a little bit sad too, and not just Pearl Harbor. There's, there's a lot that's happened here over the years. Uh, there's a dessert here called haupia, haupia. And it's like a coconut pudding. It's very traditional, lots of different recipes. They vary from family to family, kind of like flan in, in my world. And that's made its way to pie and then expanded chocolate, caramel, millionaire, fruit, uh, all sorts of things added into it. And so think about this in your business. Your SaaS probably serves a very specific market really, really well. Kind of like traditional halpia. And you know their taste, what they like, and your recipe is premium for them. Now, what if you want to expand beyond that? Not like jump categories from like pie to shrimp tacos, which now nah, I'm getting hungry thinking about this, but you know, not pie to shrimp tacos, but something adjacent, something that's pretty closely related. What does that look like for you? And in my book, Small Fish, Big Pond, one of the, the key things there is to get big, go small, which is 100% true. And when you dominate one category, then what you want to do is to expand to an adjacent market. So how do you go from coconut pudding to pie to chocolate coconut pie? And we're going to have to take a break here and uh, get some pie now. But uh, yeah, so how do you expand your menu to serve that new audience? Zoom did this in a big way about two years ago. It's a solution that we all know and, and you know, probably a lot of us use. And Zoom had successfully built a niche. I mean, their, their core was web conferencing, helping businesses connect globally. And they did that before, during, and after the pandemic. And they saw an opportunity to expand into a tangential market. They'd done that before with education, uh, particularly during the pandemic, and it was everywhere. Uh, but then they started looking at some other things. Uh, Zoomtopia 2021, they started talking about personal communication. And they could have just taken their corporate-centered tool and rolled it out for personal, but they knew better. They understood the new market had different needs and required a unique touch. So they did what any successful baker would do when crafting a new recipe. They adapted. 
they simplified their interface. Instead of having it, it cluttered and having every possible feature they could ever have, they pulled some things out. They made it very simple, very easy to use. They offered a very generous free tier and tailored their services to make family meetings, virtual hangouts, and even online weddings a piece of cake. That is really, really smart to do that. Uh, and so Zoom didn't just venture into a new market. Uh, they thrived and, and really continued to become a household name, expanded beyond business. And while you see them you know, during the, the pandemic going up and then things started to, to taper off a little bit, this market was able to continue the, the growth trend. So venturing into adjacent markets isn't about just rebaking the same pie with different fruits or flavors. Uh, it's really about understanding the new fruit its flavors, the preferences of those who enjoy it, and most importantly, who will buy it. It's about blending your baking skills with fresh knowledge to craft a pie or product that wins hearts. And what's the reward when we do that? Well, it's a larger customer base for sure. More diversified offerings. Future-proof is what we call it at Champion Leadership Group, being future-proof. And it's another successful product that is making a difference in the lives for your users. If you want to expand your market and scale your SaaS with fellow founders and executive leaders, do that with Champion Leadership Group, the ultimate resource for SaaS founders and C-suite executives to continue to develop themselves, scale their companies, and never walk alone. Unlock untapped revenue by leveraging time-tested SaaS growth principles, toolkits, playbooks, and frameworks designed to help you scale ARR from seven to eight to nine figures. Collaborate with an elite network of SaaS visionaries, celebrate wins, and overcome defeats together. Confidently take that right next step that creates a giant leap to profitable growth, premium valuation, and freedom. You can learn more at championleadership.com. Our expert guest last week was Kate DeLeo, brand architect and number one best-selling author. She shared an easy-to-follow framework to educate people about what you do in a way that's engaging. So they say, tell me more. And then you have a conversation that converts. It's super good. If you missed either one of those episodes, go back and give them a listen for sure. My guest this week is tech sales legend Craig T. Ingram. Craig T, sales strategy and go-to-market expertise in med tech, health tech. His specialty is product launch and market expansion so that growth continues in an upward trajectory. He helps companies build and adapt their recipes to create true awesomeness and has been doing this for like 20 years. We actually met in an event in Dallas and he's as sharp as they come with go-to-market expansion and market innovation. So welcome to today's guest, Craig T. Ingram. Hey, Craig, welcome to SaaS Fuel. Thank you. Well, tell me a little bit about your background in sales and SaaS and medical. Yeah, so it all started when my dad had uh, esophageal cancer. And um, my brother-in-law was a medical lease. He worked for a leasing company and, and he was leasing medical equipment. And so I got exposed to medical devices and technology uh, early, early on uh, in, in my uh, mid-teens. And I got really intrigued by that because I saw what some of these medical devices could do. And we imported some of these medical devices from uh, Europe and they were not FDA approved in the United States. So we were using them off label and that intrigued me. Why aren't we having technologies come over here and allow some of these terminally ill patients to see what these things can do? Right. And then obviously sure. there's, that, that's a whole nother show, obviously, but um, right. how I got into the med tech health tech uh, field is, is through that and seeing those technologies. And then I ended up selling some of those technologies that were used on him. Uh, when I was a sophomore in college, I started a medical distribution company and was selling products to physician offices, hospitals, surgery centers, and other clinics uh, in between classes. And uh, then I went to work for Johnson & Johnson for 10 years and then got in what I really enjoy is the venture capital private equity uh, company supported uh, or, or, or sorry, venture capital and private equity funded supported companies. And that's what really sure. I've been doing pretty much ever since. 
So what what do you see as the you know, where sales are today, and you know where is it going? How has it changed over the years? Selling now is more of a conversation. It's not so much technique driven. It's really more of a conversation. The people who come across very authentic, um, real, no nonsense um, are the ones that are actually going to be getting more of the potential customers. Those are the people that people want to do business with. You know, people say, well, people buy from who they really like and who they trust. Well, you can't trust somebody in the matter of minutes. You can't trust somebody in my view, even in a year or two, it takes years to build trust with somebody, right? Real authentic, deep rooted trust. Um, you only need to trust somebody enough. If you see that they're no nonsense, if they have your best interests at heart. And I've actually told physicians, I've told hospitals, I've said, you know what? I just don't think this is right for you right now. I really would like you to have it. It sure helped me out, but it's not the right thing to do. And then I've had people where they've actually started selling me that they need it. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I know that's a technique, but I didn't mean it like that. You know what I mean? Um, and I think the reason I've, I've been able to, um, build such a loyal following in, in, in the health tech, med tech industry is because I am not going to do business with somebody. Um, if for lack of a better term, if they're kind of fugazi, right? If, if, if there's somebody that's just, um, only about them and it's all about them and it's an opportunistic opportunity, I don't want to do business with those type of people. And so I just think that's come across and I've built a loyal following and a loyal, um, uh, connection within business with people that, uh, um, breeds that type of value. Now they may not like my straightforwardness and my bluntness, but at the end of the day, they know that they're not going to get, um, stabbed behind the back. Yeah, that's really important. Yeah. What do you think the relationship is between sales and marketing? I mean, a lot of times those are kind of two different functions. How should they work together and how have you seen that happen? So marketing is nothing more when you boil it all down is getting your name of your company, the name of your product or service and what it does for your potential customers and clients. Marketing is nothing more than getting the word out. That's it. That's what it's about. It's about getting people to know uh, who you are, what you do, and what you can provide for them. People like to make it really more exotic and make it more complicated than that, but that's all it is. It's making people aware that your product, service, and company is available to do business with them. Right. And if it solves a problem, if it solves challenges in their workplace or, or breeds a better opportunity, uh, for them to be more effective, then they should buy your products and service. Period. If it doesn't, they shouldn't. Now, in the relationship with selling, selling is getting people to rationalize why they should own your product or service because they have, uh, had some type of, uh, awareness of who you are and what you bring to the table. That makes sense. So in, in commercialization and bringing things to market, uh, where do you see the, that breakdown within sales and marketing? Is there a clean handoff and what, what happens and how do, how do companies make mistakes in their commercialization strategy? The biggest way people make mistakes is they do everything in a silo, right? And so what I mean by that is that, oh, we're only going to do social media marketing, or we're only going to do print marketing, or we're only going to do webinars, or we're only good, right? It's all of the, it's all of the above. All of that type of marketing should be happening at the same time. So people can become familiar with your company, your product and service. The biggest breakdown is that people try to do marketing activities on the cheap. They try to do stuff for free, right? We get what we pay for. That's a lot, yeah. Right? And so um, if we try to build a company on a shoestring budget, it's not going to work, right? But yet it does need to fit a realistic budget. It does need to fit a realistic uh, profit and loss strategy, right? Um, but from a commercialization standpoint, you, you can't rely just on your salespeople, 
right? There's pull marketing and push marketing. And, and selling is push marketing, right? You're going after prospects. You're going after your target market, right? Pull marketing is letting people know what you do, how you do it, what's in it for them, and you're pulling them in. It's a push-pull strategy that has to work simultaneously. And from a commercialization standpoint, it goes beyond just sales and marketing. It, in, in healthcare, even in a, in a healthcare uh, software platform, it might need to be HIPAA uh, compliant. It might need to have certain securities sure. involved, right? There might need to be an ISO 2001 certification. You might, if you're selling in Europe, you're going to have to have a CE mark, right? Even just to sell a pencil, it has to have a CE mark, right? So let alone advanced technologies. So the biggest breakdown is people try to do it in a silo, right? People try to do business in a silo and it's not individual lanes, but it's all the lanes of a, of a highway being used simultaneously, right? So if we're in an eight lane highway, right? Eight line each, eight lanes each side of, right? Total 16 highways, northbound, southbound, right? We want all eight lanes on that one side working together back and forth so that it creates a fluidity, right? In traffic, but we want to be able to conceptually implement that in our business at the same time. And that is the biggest downfall, in, in with executive leaders that I see is that it's not that their their different departments are not working in an ebb and flow organic manner because they as the senior leadership are only doing what they've been taught working in other companies instead of thinking outside of the norm and saying how can I make this better faster more efficient Right. And so that's what I see the biggest challenges is it's not working together. Everybody's staying in their own lane. And there are times people need to stay in their own lane, right? Uh, appropriately. But also, if you're not, if you're not opening up your lane or your department or your, your project so that it works together with the other departments and other projects and other things, uh, objectives that the company's working on, then you're going to create animosity. I mean, it, it really, that's where corporate culture then starts to becoming the issue. Sure. So you said, you know, marketing, sales, you got some differences there. If you were going to double the budget for sales or for marketing and the, the, the goal is to grow the company, which one do you double? I would split in half and, and, and actually increase both. Both. Yeah, I would. So I wouldn't do one or the other. I would let's, so let's say, you know, Hey, we just got, you know, $10 million in funding. What should I do? Let's increase the marketing dollars to let people know who we are and what we do. And what, what, and what we could do for them. And let's increase the amount of salespeople, right? That can go and knock on those doors and prospect and try to close some business and get people to understand, um, what it is and how it's going to work for them. Cause marketing really doesn't tell you how it just tells you the what, who, where, right? And the salespeople can really peel back the onion, the, the layers of the onion and really get into a potential customer's situation and say, this is how it's going to work for you. This is why it would work for you or why or why not it would work for you. And that makes sense. Yeah. That's yeah, interesting doing both. I, I think sales hires are one of the hardest hires to make. I've been doing this for a long, long time. And, you know, even my track record is, is not that great. How do you know if a salesperson is going to be fantastic or if they're just selling you that they're really good? Well, and that's the $25,000 question, right? So like million dollar question. Right, right, right. You know, I think of the $25,000 <laughs> pyramid, right? It shows my age yeah, yeah, yeah. of the TV show, right? Um, there is no way to really know if somebody's going to be good or not. We tend to hire in a silo. If we're selling software products, then we need to hire people that have sold software products. Well, why? Why not, why not hire somebody that has mastered the art of selling? Because if they've done that, the product is irrelevant. The only thing that changes is the questions that they ask to the, to the new target market. And they obviously would need to learn the product and service 
you know, itself and the competitors. So they know how to position themselves against the competitors and know what their unique selling proposition is and know what their value proposition is. Um, and so I, I am a huge advocate. Don't hire background, hire skill set. And it's just not resonating in corporate America, to be quite honest with you. People wonder why there are only a very, very, very few small elite entrepreneurs and CEOs and business owners that have made it into the hundreds of millions and billions of, of liquid net personal net worth. It's because they do the opposite of everybody else. Now, in the med tech sure. world, in the health tech world, um, we love to hire people that have a background in a certain widget or certain sector, right? right. We're selling right. SaaS products, selling medical devices, selling pharmaceuticals, whatever the case may be. Oh, well, they got an orthopedic background, so I got to hire somebody with an orthopedic background. Why? Why are you doing the same thing that everybody else does, expecting different results? Right. I mean, when I was a sales rep, every company I ended up going to was a company where I was never in that sector. So I went from pain management to OBGYN to urology to orthopedics to otolaryngology. I mean, and I never had any background in that, in those, in those sectors. And yet I was, depending on, on the year and depending on the company, I was anywhere in the top 8% all the way to the top 1% you know, rep of the year or, or regional sales director of the year or whatever. Um, and it's, and it's because the, when you have the fundamentals of business, I won't say mastered, but when you're advanced in the fundamentals of business, the widget or the service that you're providing or selling to the marketplace is lower of importance on the totem pole because you only have to then craft your target market, who you're going to be selling to, which is your target market and how you're going to sell them to. So there's some work that you're going to have to change from industry to industry to industry or product sector to product sector to product sector, whatever. So there is some work on, on, on adapting. But at the end of the day, when you, when you know how to position products and services in the right way, making the, the opportunity for the target, targeted customer um, if it's a good idea or a bad idea um, for them to to take ownership and purchase that product or service, then that's how you build trust. And at the end of the day, you're going to be very successful because when you master the art of selling or become advanced selling uh, person, you are going to be able to sell that product no matter what industry it is, no matter what product or product sector that it that it, that it is that fits into as well. Yeah, I like that. I mean, people are people regardless of, of industry. So you sell in one and, and you're successful, you can move to another. You can. Like Absolutely. that, just for diversity. And it's not uh, the way somebody looks, that's not diversity, but it's that background. It's bringing practices from different uh, different organizations, different industries. Something that's old in one industry is revolutionary to another. Right. I mean, you can put those things together. <laughs> Magic happens. It, it's true. I mean, we've been exposed to some extremely... Um, top one one hundredth of one percent income earners, you know, in, in the world, right? And yes. when we sit down and talk to the JT Foxes of the world, to the billionaire Freds of the world, to Tycoon X or to people like Adam Coffee or whatever, and we say, what do you do different than 99.9999% of everybody else? And they tell us what they do, you go, well, no wonder they're the ultra successful. They're right. the successful. It's not There's what everybody else is doing. People, right? And it's because they yeah. do the opposite of what everybody else does, right? And that is the key: is finding out what people are doing and see how you can do it different. And more than likely, most of the time, you'll find that it's more successful and it works better because you become the the neon green fish in a silver fish pond. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, tell me about uh, Business Kryptonite. I know you're working on a, a book. What is that all about? I am. You know, I, you know, I always like to say to people, what's the kryptonite in your business? What are the things that as you are able to step away from your business, from your company, what are some of the things that can pull your company down? 
What can, what, what are some things that can take away from the effectiveness of what you're trying to do? And I never hear this, but after long conversations in my head, I can boil it down. Um, number one is office politics. That really hurts a business, right? Whether we're hiring to people that, that have scratched our back or we're hiring people because it's our you know, cousin or nephew or niece or whatever, right? Or aunt or whatever, right? We're, we're, we're bringing people into the fold due to favoritism, not due to skill set, right? So I find that that is number one, although people don't think of it that way. People aren't, or if they do think it, they're not going to admit it many times, Right. But after I do have these long conversations, I find that that is the number one thing that can hurt a company is the office politics. Right. Number two is not being able to take constructive feedback from people lower on the on the totem pole in your company. I found very situ- I was in a situation in 2020 where I knew a guy for, I worked with him in two different companies knew him for 14 years and I talked to him about some things that he was doing that was hurting the field sales organization and within 3 months I found myself uh looking for a new opportunity <laughs> And it had nothing to do with skill set. It had nothing to do with results. It had everything to do with the person had super thin skin and couldn't handle the authentic, real feedback of how he was hurting the people that were working for him. And, um, you know, come to find out the company's not doing well at all, but and, and which, which, which makes me really sad honest with you. Um, but at the end of the day, there, there are so many kryptonite, you know, p- things in a company that can bring it down. And, and, and part of it is, is not executing properly, micromanaging to the level of how many sales calls did you make today? If you have to ask that of somebody, either A, you hired the wrong people or B, you are not a good management professional in being able to set the stage for people to want to get out there and hustle. Right. Um, I mean, I, I could talk for this for hours, but I mean, those seem to be the, the, the top two is, is, is the micro level management instead of, instead of, I always say this, it, it's better to have to manage somebody than supervise them. That's an interesting distinction. How do you know what the the difference is and you know who do you need to manage and who do you need to supervise? How do you divide those up and what is the line? Well, y- nobody really knows at first, right? Unless you've hired somebody that that you've 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 managed before. Uh but I call I call a supervisor role or I see a lot of managers in a supervisor role, right? They may have an area director, VP of Mar- you know, a VP of uh, the Western region or something like that. But when you look at their, their, their activities, they're more of a supervisor. They're wanting to know, you know, did you talk to this person at this facility or did you talk to this specific person at this company? And you're like, you know, now some of that is appropriate, but there's a point where you go, man, you're really digging deep here on the day to day stuff. Wouldn't you rather be working on? your company than working in your company, right? And so if you have to supervise people to the point of, you know, are they showing up on time? Are they, you know, call me, how many calls are they making a day or what, what are their micro level activities for the day that they got done? Um, you are probably in the wrong role, right? Or you hired the wrong people, right? And so management for me is more of a macro level, than a micro level where super, super, uh, supervising is more of a micro level. And, and there are, I've, I've had experiences in both where I've had some really good leaders and managers, uh, manage me. And I've had, uh, leaders and managers that, uh, have supervised me. And as a self starter, as somebody who doesn't need their hand to be held, um, it, it, it actually demotivates me. It actually annoys the heck out of me. And I think when you 
hang out with people and you've built a reputation of, of, of having very high financial business success, you don't need to have your hand held. And when people hold your hand, it gets really frustrating because at the underlying tone is we don't trust you. Now, you shouldn't trust people until they've earned the right to be trusted. And like I said, that may take months. It may take years. It's definitely not going to take weeks. You know, for me to trust somebody takes years. Um, but when they keep passing the tests over and over and over again, when, when you, when you, when you're constantly testing them, guess what? They are trustworthy people. Right. And those are the people who I like to ma- manage, to be honest with you. I don't want to have to supervise people. I hope that answered that question specifically. Yeah. So then the supervision, you're saying it takes a while to trust. Does that mean that you start as a supervisor and transition into managers? They prove themselves or what does that look like? Yeah. I mean, I've had, I, whenever I've been in a company and I've been in a, a leadership management role, I do supervise a little bit at first, right? Because I want to get to know what they do, how they do it, why they do it, and what type of normal results are they finding? Right. And so I do dig deep right in the beginning. And then as trust is built, I let off because I don't want to have to micromanage these people. I don't want to have to look at the day to day. But when I don't know them and I don't know their processes and I don't know their motivations and I don't know what their results really have been in a company, um, you know, they can tell me what the results results are, right? But and, and until I see it, until I witness it, um, but in, in there are people where I've had to supervise them for a year, year and a half, and then there's other people where I've had to only supervise them for literally just a quarter or so because they've been they've 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 shown themselves trustworthy sooner, right? And if somebody can show that. And not just talk the talk, then I, I I I I back off quite a bit, right? So, and is that a difference in delegating tasks of here the number of calls you have to make, here are the things you have to do, versus delegating outcomes of here's the number you need to hit, <laughs> and and then managing that? You nailed it. That's exactly what it is, right? I mean, at the end of the day, towards towards my active selling career as a sales rep. Um, before I got into, you know, VP of sales and marketing or national sales director role or, or even, you know, my role now with chief ex- experience officer in a consulting company. Um, it, it is about the delegation, right? I'm always delegating stuff to people because I want to see who drops the ball and who doesn't. Now, we all drop the ball once in a while. That's just flat out fact. Right. I, I, it, it annoys me a little bit when people say, well, you, you're allowed to make a mistake, but don't repeat it. Well, <laughs> humans are going to repeat mistakes, maybe not right away, but over time, it just happens. Right. We're flawed people. Sure. Right. And so because of that, you know, it just should not be a consistent entourage of mistake after mistake <laughs> after mistake. Right. Then should be the same one every day. Right. Um, you know, but usually, you know, and, and, and if you give people grace to fail forward, you're just going to figure out what's not working and they're going to find out what is working, right? I mean, Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant both said, we miss more shots than we ever make, but we keep making the shots because we know that at least the more shots I take, the more are going to go in at some point. Yeah. So thinking about outcomes and delegating those, what are key performance indicators you've seen that have worked really well that they really help with execution and, and moving things forward? Are there specific ones or is it industry specific? No, I think well, I mean, some are industry specific, but I like to put individual KPIs together, right? For, for my teams, right? Whether it's on a national level or regional level or local level. Um, I like finding out, you know, um, how many, you know, of the specific target market, right? Um, how many physicians are you talking to a day if it's a medical device or if it's a, a SaaS product? Um, how many uh, chief operating officers are you reaching out to per week or per day or something like that, right? So I want to know that the action and the activity that they're doing is relatable to the outcome that needs to be achieved, Right. And so from a KPI standpoint, um, we're also going to look at, um, 
we're going to look at uh, uh, how how often are you able to fly to a certain city and and get to a conference, right? To go to go uh, meet these people. There's so many different actions that can be strategic or can be tactical to achieve the outcome that is needed. You know, I, I love it when, when uh, Hugh Hilton said to me, he says, Craig, business is not that hard. It's, oh, it's just about when you wake up in the morning and you get to your office, what are you doing when you get to your office? Right? If you're doing the, if you're doing the necessary actions that get that prospective customer, then you're not going to have to worry about getting customers. Now, you may not hit the number that you want to hit, right? Because sometimes the number's inflated and sometimes there's economic and, and, and outside factors that can prevent you. But when you are doing the necessary uh, grinding task, and it doesn't matter if you're a CEO, chairman of the board, or you're an associate sales rep, you're going to have tasks that are just grinding every single day that you have to do that you don't want to do. You know, and, and I laugh. It's part of it. What's that? I said, that's part of it. Right. Right. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to have to make, you know, 25 calls a day to do X, Y, and Z. I don't want to have to do uh, one-on-ones with all my sales reps, you know, every week. I, I mean, there's just some things I'm like, oh, I don't want to do it. But that's business, right? People, it's, it, I kind of chuckle when people are like, I only do things I love in my business. I'm like, well, then you're not going to succeed. Because <laughs> I would say seven out of 10 things in business, I don't feel like doing. I don't want to do because <laughs> they're not fun, Right. And the three things that are fun, I do enjoy doing, right? I wish I could do them more. Sure. But, but effective business is really more about, you know, doing what you don't want to do when you don't feel like doing it, but you do it anyway. That's how we move forward. Yeah. Yeah. So from a KPI standpoint, I mean, gosh, how many people are you talking to? How many proposals have you ha- have gone out? Um, how many, um, how many conferences are you planning on being or have you been to this quarter? You know, there's just so many different niche based KPIs that you, you can put together, but it's all based upon the objective you want to receive or hit and then work backwards. And then you're going to know what, what, what needs to be measured so that you can hit that outcome or at least come close to that outcome. I think that's really important is really starting with the end. We, you know, what is that outcome? And then what are the activities that, that drive that? Yeah. And uh, is there one that is, is key? Is there something that happens in every one of those that we can measure? You know, kind of, you know, what's the North Star? You know, what is it that, that we're measuring that, uh, that we, can, we can use as a barometer to know that that's going to generate revenue? Yeah. Or a percentage of revenue? Yeah. You know, whether that be demos or contacts or, you know, whatever it is. Yeah, hundred um, percent. And you said demos, right? Like I know where, like in 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 software as a service, right, or even medical devices, um, it's about how many demonstrations did you do, right? How many how sure. many uh, platform opportunities did you give that potential customer? that prospect, an opportunity to, to play with your technology, to, to, to experience your uh, software platform, right? To see how it might fit into their, into their business repertoire, right? And so those things are super important because what gets measured gets done. It's true. So how do you think sales changes in a recession versus an economic boom? Man, that's a tough question. Gosh. You know, when we're in an economic boom, it seems that the it's all mindset, right? Oh, I can buy this. I can put it on a credit card or I can leverage this debt and I can pay it off later, right? Because things are just going to keep happening, right? But then you get into an economic pullback and you go, what are my necessities that I need to buy and what are the nice to haves? And so from a selling standpoint, it drastically changes. You have to be able to genuinely 
help that potential customer realize that your product and service is going to give them a positive return, right? Whatever that positive return is, most of the time in a business to business standpoint, it's going to be uh, revenue, market share, and profit, right? One of those three things um, or a combination of all three. Um, if it's a business to consumer standpoint, it's, it's what, what is making their life easier, right? And so the way that you sell is, is going to change a little bit. What doesn't change is if you genuinely see through the selling process that it's really not going to benefit them, just cut it off, you know, cut it off and just say, this isn't going to, this isn't for you. It really isn't right? You're going to build so much more credibility. Yeah, it might hurt your pocketbook in the short term, but it's not going to hurt your pocketbook in the long term. It's not. And, sure. and you know, I hear people say that, but then in certain situations, I'll see them do it and, and I'll be like, hey, do you think that was the right product for this, you know, potential uh, healthcare provider or whatever? And they're like, yeah, I think it's going to help them out a bit. I'm, and, I, and then I come back and say, in a percentage wise, how, 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 how much do you think it's going to help them? And then they go, uh, maybe only 40%. Okay. Would you want to be, would you want to spend your hard earned money on something that you're going to use 40% of the time? Now it might be real critical in those 40% of cases, situations that they may really need it. But again, sure. that's where the ethics and integrity and character come in on, on selling differently in an economic boom versus selling differently. In, in an economic pullback or recession, potentially, you're going to have to adjust your style a little bit. But one thing will never change is how you do business. And I see no, that, people that's, talk the talk that's a something lot. Something that is core. Absolutely. Yeah. I see people talk the talk a lot. I don't see them walk the walk a lot. And of course, I'm the jerk because I call it out. <laughs> So what is something you know today about sales that you've experienced or learned that you wish you'd known back in the beginning? If you go back and tell yourself, what would that thing be? Address the objections immediately. Right? Interesting. When I train people and when I coach people um, and manage people, I tell them up front, you know the objections that people are going to have incorporate that into your presentation, incorporate that into your conversation. Maybe, maybe you're, maybe in, maybe in a, a specific company or industry, you're not going to do a formal presentation, but you are going to have a, a, a formal conversation, right? Tell them up front, listen, you know what? A lot of people, you know, in this situation, think this, 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 and this, and you know what? Sometimes they're right. You know, and, you know, and so you have to address and bring it up to them so that you can bring it to the surface, address it, give them an antidote for that objection so that they are much more at ease in purchasing mm -hmm. your product or service. So I wish I would have known like that. that. A long time ago, right? Yeah. <laughs> so now when I'm when I'm coaching my sales teams and things like that, uh, I, I I I I coach them and build into the presentations and the conversations that they're having. Address it up front. Don't hide from it, right? Because if they if if it comes up later or if it never comes up and then comes up after they buy, then you've just ru ruined your credibility. And from the time you're born to the time you die. You have one thing that follows you, and that's your credibility. Yep. That's it. Absolutely. Nothing else comes. No, there's nothing else. And so you can either build your wealth and your business uh, on a rock, or you can build it on sand. And we know what happens when you build it on sand, but people still try to do it. Yeah. And, and they make headlines for the wrong reasons. <laughs> they sure do. <laughs> I don't ever want to be in those headlines. So yeah. thank God yeah. I've got people to help me keep me accountable too. Because yeah. sometimes we're just blinded to stuff, right? I mean, I've sure. said something before, you know, I've said stuff before in a sales presentation or whatever. And I'm like, oh yeah, we can do this or that or whatever, right? And and they'll be like, Craig, no, we can't. And I'm like, why not? Well, blah, blah, blah. 
minute that I'm like, I either drive back to them or I pick up the phone and go, you know what? I told you X, but we can't do X. Here's what we can do. And I'm really sorry that I said we could do X. I really thought we could, but we can't. Yeah. Right. And I've had people get mad at me, right? Oh, you know, you're just like one of those other salespeople or, you know, whatever. And I've had other, I've had other people go, gosh, thanks for being proactive and coming to me like without being asked. Right. That's yeah, helpful. It is very helpful. <laughs> yeah. As you bring up a really interesting point just about the accountability and having other people, what role have mentors played in your success? Well, I will tell you, um, I don't have a lot of mentors. I've paid for a lot of coaches. I've actually paid for coaching. Mentors too, are yeah. kind of nice, but they don't really tell you what you need to hear right? Because they don't want to really, most of the time, hurt your feelings. Um, and plus, um, they may not have a vested interest in you. So I'm always willing to pay for a coach. And right now, I've got a handful of coaches that I pay for. And the nice thing about it is, you know, they're in the top one-tenth of one percent of income earners, you know, in, in, in the United States. And they're probably in the one one-hundredth uh, income earners in, in, in the world. Um, and, and I stress that because money in business is the result of business done well. It just is. Money is the problem. That's how we keep score. People are like, oh, yeah. I don't do that for money. Well, really? You do it for free? Like, if you do it for free, then you're doing charity work. And I'm super cool with that. But don't tell me. I was looking for a, I was looking for a uh, lawnmower the other day. And this salesman at this one place goes, yeah, I'm really not making any money off this. I looked right at him and I said, then how do you stay in business? Why are you doing this if you're not making money? <laughs> he just looked at me like, oh my gosh. I go, sorry, dude, I can't do business with you. He's, yeah. he's like, well, you know, that's a deal killer. Not making a large, you know, uh, margin on this. And I said, dude, you lost me. Yeah, you're, you're making zero now. You lost me. <laughs> don't tell me you're yeah. not making money because you're not going to work to work for free. So don't, don't even go there. You know what I mean? So, um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It, it's, it, it's interesting. Yeah, it is. Well, where can people learn more about you and uh, follow you online? Yeah. So, uh, the way to follow me online is on LinkedIn at Craig T. Ingram. Um, you can also get on my website at medicalsalesgrowth.com. And I put medical sales growth because it encompasses all of healthcare. Right. And it's also easy to remember. <laughs> sure. Um, I like that. Yeah. And, you know, whether, I, whether I'm involved in a, a healthcare SaaS product, a healthcare platform as a service product, medical devices, telemedicine services, um, you name it, anything healthcare that can be commercialized to help other businesses and people thrive, solve problems, um, make their business more effective. Um, that's where I come in. I help companies become more profitable, gain market share, increase revenue, because I can help them with their commercialization, right? And that commercialization starts right from a manufacturing process all the way to that customer getting that product in hand and start using it. And it's everything in between. So it's not just sales and marketing from a commercialization standpoint, even though I am not a materials expert by any mean with manufacturing. However, we do got to make sure that if it's a product, there's enough inventory on hand as a, as a continuous sure. flow, right? Uh, it might be FDA regulatory from a healthcare standpoint, right? I've got people in, in, in that are phenomenal at uh, regulatory processes, uh, country specific, industry specific. Um, but I've built my 26 years in healthcare, right? Health tech, med tech, biotech, farm tech. Um, I, I've, I've pretty much done it all. Um, but yet at the same time, I still learn, right? I don't know everything. Right. And that's sure. why I still pay for coaches because I need some of these high net worth people that have built multiple business. I call them serial CEOs. Right. And they help me where my gaps still are and where my gaps will be in the future. They will help me bridge those gaps. Very good. Well, thanks for being on the show. It was a great conversation. Really enjoyed it, Craig. Thanks, Jeff. I always love hanging out with you, man. It's awesome. And I <laughs> love how when we first met at that JT Fox event with Adam Coffey, and you got a taste of these like ultra high successful nine and 10 figure liquid net worth serial CEOs. 
And um, it's just so cool how, it's a how great time. we were able to be there and see it firsthand together. And and uh, there's going to be a lot of really cool things to come with you and I, I think, in the future. Um, and so if I can help you or any of your listeners become more effective at, at commercialization, uh, I'd be more than willing to help them out. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Thanks, man. Good to see you. You too. Wow. Give it up for Craig T. Thanks, Craig, for coming on the show and sharing your insights. You can learn more about Craig and market expansion at medicalsalesgrowth.com. As always, all links, highlights, resources, and full show notes are available at sasfuel.com. And be sure to check out our new YouTube channel. You can link to it right there from sasfuel.com. It is packed with full episode shorts, interviews, outtakes, goofy things, bugs flying into my mouth, after show bonus cuts, and more. And while you're there, subscribe and follow us. The team loves that, lets them know you appreciate what we're doing. And everyone who subscribes this week gets a pie chart pie pan because, you know, who said data can't be delicious? Perfect for those looking to combine their love for stats and sweets. Join us next week for a hundred episodes. It's actually 99 and 100, or if you count the trailer, it's 100 and 101. But either way, we are celebrating all week long live interviews, returned founder guests, giving their number one advice tip. Really, really great. And a surprise or two. It's going to be awesome. Invite a friend, share the podcast, and come back next week. 100th episode, episodes coming your way. Well, mahalo from the Big Island, and as always, enjoy the journey. Thanks for listening to SAS Fuel. Full show notes for each episode, which includes a summary, key takeaways, quotes, and any resources mentioned, are available at sasfuel.com. Be sure to follow and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you're enjoying the content and getting value from these episodes, please leave us a rating and review at ratethispodcast.com slash sassfuel. We'll be sure to read these out on future episodes. Let's go!